to this event, which is the fifth in our Climate Solution Series, supporting the work of the Zero, Cumbria, Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnerships, uh, farming and other land use sector group. As you may know, previous events have focused on trees, peatlands, rivers and hedgerows, and recordings of these events are available on the CAF's YouTube channel. As you may also know, the Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnership is made up of more than 80 community, private and public sector organisations, and our ambition is a Zero Carbon Cumbria by 2037. Cumbria is understandably famous for lakes and mountains, but also has a substantial coastline, more than 150 miles, stretching from Morecambe Bay to the Solway Firth. And while the focus of the ZCCP sector groups is on emission reduction, we also recognize the importance of building sequestration capacity to absorb carbon dioxide and the need to adapt to the effects of climate change. And Cumbria is no stranger to the effects of extreme weather events. We also recognize that there are significant opportunities associated with low carbon technologies, such as wind energy and other renewables. In a moment, we'll hear from the three presenters who will speak about some of these topics in the context of coastlines. Following the three presentations, we'll then have around 20 minutes for combined question and answers and discussion. Uh, so please use the Zoom chat for any comments or questions. So without any further ado, I'd like to pass across to Amber Gould from the Cumbria Wildlife Trust, who's going to tell us about blue carbon solutions to the climate crisis. Over to you, Amber. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, John, for that introduction and for having me. And thank you to everyone for coming along and listening today. So, yes, my name is Amber and I work on the marine team of Cumbria Wildlife Trust. And today I'm going to give just a bit of a lowdown on sort of what blue carbon solutions we have um, in order to tackle um, the climate crisis. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll start by giving a, just a brief cover of what we currently have as a state of CO2 emissions, both globally and in the UK. And then we'll go into a bit of detail about what we mean by blue carbon habitats and um, how they work. I'll then move into sort of giving some examples of types of blue carbon habitats that we have in the UK. We'll focus predominantly on seagrass and salt marsh, but we'll consider some other potential blue carbon habitats as well um, before sort of drawing to some conclusions. Next slide, please. So um, our, as I'm sure many of you are aware, our global CO2 emissions have been increasing drastically since the Industrial Revolution, um, which has caused global temperatures to rise, um, and that is having catastrophic implications for our climate, which then affects our health, global ecosystems, and the weather, alongside numerous other consequences. Exactly. And the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change has stated after their last report that it's now or never to move to a lower carbon society and limit our global temperatures to a 1.5 degree um, increase above pre-industrial levels so that we can stave off climate breakdown. Next slide, please. So this is a map of our um, UK CO2 emissions. So out of 195 nations that committed to combat climate change, 12 of those countries have passed actual legislation to meet net zero targets, and the UK is one of them. So net zero as a concept refers to the amount of carbon being emitted into the atmosphere being equal to or less than the amount that we're removing. The United Kingdom is aiming to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And if you just say next slide, please, you should be able to see that we have quite a long way to go before we reach that target. So next slide, please. <laughs> so this is kind of where blue carbon comes in. So we have a lot of different strategies and initiatives that we're employing in order to reach that net zero target, including including things like renewable energies and a sort of planting of more kind of terrestrial carbon um, habitats, such as forests and things like that. But we also have um, blue carbon habitats. So blue carbon as a term refers to the carbon that's captured by our ocean, marine and coastal ecosystems. Um, 
carb these ecosystems can act as carbon sinks, which means that the system overall captures more carbon and removes more carbon from the atmosphere than it does emit. Um, so putting those two things together, blue carbon habitats are habitats that remove and store carbon from the atmosphere and do that in a net positive removal. Um, meaning that it's removing more carbon than it is putting back in. And we know that our blue carbon habitats um, sequester, which is that removal and storage process, approximately 2% of all of the carbon that we emit in the UK each year. Next slide, please. Put the waste coat on and we'll get another That's So um, if we go into a bit more detail of how blue carbon habitats actually store that carbon. So this is predominantly through um, the plant matter and organic matter that's held within these ecosystems. So in the process of photosynthesis and plants growing, plants will absorb atmospheric CO2 and they will convert that into what's known as organic carbon. So this is carbon that's held within the molecules that are used to build the the actual plant itself so that carbon can be held within the roots the leaves any kind of part of the plant really um, and it's sort of locked away there when that plant dies the remains of that enter the soil and this is the same with animals as well that may be feeding on those plants those remains kind of go into the soil or sediment that they're living in on land we have um, a lot of oxygen and the microbes and microorganisms that exist in those soils can use that oxygen to sort of breathe and they break down that organic matter fairly quickly. And in the process of breaking down that organic matter through sort of digesting it, um, that some of that CO2 is released back into the atmosphere. However, in our coastal and marine ecosystems, because those soils and sediments are flooded quite a lot of the time, there's a lot less oxygen, which means that the decomposition process is much slower. And that means that instead of all of that organic matter um, getting um, converted back into atmospheric CO2, being digested and decomposed, a lot of that organic matter actually doesn't get a chance to do that and gets buried under more organic matter as it comes down on top. So that means that the carbon held within that organic matter that was initially taken out of the atmosphere hasn't gone back and when those habitats are left undisturbed um, they can store that carbon away for hundreds to even thousands of years. Next slide please. So is everyone kind of okay with what blue carbon habitats are and how that process works? I'm seeing some nods and no panicked messages in the chat so we'll go from there. <laughs> okay so We've got quite a few habitats that can potentially be considered as blue carbon habitats. The most well studied and the ones that are sort of most robustly known as blue carbon globally are seagrass, salt marsh and mangrove forest. And we have a lot of seagrass and salt marsh here in the UK. There are some other less well studied habitats that have the potential to be blue carbon habitats, but they're not currently acknowledged or considered um, by the UK government um, and are not incorporated into any kind of blue carbon decisions or legislation and we'll go into why that is in more detail later on in the presentation. Next slide please. Okay so the first topic the first habitat that we're going to cover is uh, salt marsh. We have a lot of this in the uh, in the northwest it's with all of that muddy bit that you see when you go out um, onto the coastline. So salt marsh begins as mudflat and mudflat begins as sheltered areas of the coast where those fine sediments, so mud and silts and clays, get a chance to settle um, and aren't taken away by the tide. Um, so this is often in the kind of sheltered harbours and estuaries that you have around the coast. Um, over time, those sediments build up and eventually um, that mud rises above the water level. At this point, when it's considered a mudflat, um, the plants that are then able to colonise this mud because it's sort of out in the open start to convert it to salt marsh. So you'll get salt marsh plants such as um, glasswort or samphire, things like that, that are coming in and starting to grow in this mud. When that happens, the plants and their roots are able to capture more sediment um, and they hold the sediment that's there um, much more securely, which allows the marsh to continue building when more sediments washed over by the high tide. And it also allows that um, that area to dry out a bit. And this process eventually results in salt marsh habitat being formed. 
through the processes that we talked about earlier, um, salt marsh can and will lock away quite a lot of organic matter into its sort of mud and that can extend several metres deep. And one hectare of salt marsh can store away up to two tonnes of carbon a year. And this is one of the habitats that if it's left undisturbed, it can lock that carbon away for thousands of years. Next slide, please. So, um, I can't go into talking about salt marsh with talking about some other reasons as to why this is a really important habitat as well. Um, one of the really important um, services that salt marsh gives to us, as well as being a blue carbon habitat, is that it offers us an awful lot of coastal protection by acting as a buffer between the sea and our kind of coastal communities. Because those plants trap sediment um, and prevent that sediment from being drained away, it forms a really good protection for our coastal areas from um, erosion by the sea and is a really good sort of zone to stop that um, process happening and through that as well it's a really important flood defense to our coastal communities um, by both preventing both by being an area that is between um, the coastal community and the um, and the sea both in sort of normal situations and in storms um, but they are also um, there's been research to show that um, these salt marsh ecosystems can reduce wave height in storms as well so when you've got these powerful waves coming in that could potentially cause some damage the salt marsh is actively reducing the energy and the impact of those waves as well as this um, because they're sort of again they're in that sort of zone between the land and the sea they can um, filter water coming through so they can be an important um, benefit to water quality coming back into uh, the sea and from a wildlife perspective they are a really really important habitat for um, hundreds of um, well, thousands of waders and waterfowl. So these are our wading birds and our wintering um, birds that often come through the area. Um, and this is because they will feed on the sort of invertebrate species. So things like a kind of um, sea snails and, and um, things like that that are using the mud as their habitat these um, wading birds will come and use that as a food source. And so some examples that we have are things like oyster catches, which um, many of you may know of, and then curlews as well. And the picture here is of a curlew in a salt marsh habitat. Um, so as well as having that blue carbon benefit, they're also really important for a whole number of reasons as well. Next slide, please. So, Salt marsh is a habitat that can quite often come under pressure. And one of the reasons that that is, is because it's quite often found next to areas that we use quite intensively, um, such as agricultural land, but also because they're on the coast, these areas can often be quite developed. Um, so they think of things like kind of just just sort of coastal towns or developments often encroaching on these areas that would typically be salt marsh and historically, um, these areas have been converted from salt marsh into other land use. Um, as well as this, the sea levels are rising. Um, that provides a challenge in terms of the salt marsh being able to rise out of the water. And hotter and drier summers are also affecting um, potentially the ability of the plants there to thrive as well. So these are all things that are causing potential declines in salt marsh ecosystems. And we're estimating that as much as 4.5% of the salt marsh that we have remaining in the UK could be lost over the next 20 years. Next slide, please. So, however, there's a lot of work being done in the UK to restore and protect salt marsh. Um, there's numerous different ways that that is being done. So we'll briefly cover um, what some of those are. So we can protect and restore the salt marsh habitat that we already have. And that can be by just encouraging it and giving it a little bit more of a boost um, in that sort of natural process and speeding it up a little bit. So that can be by going out and actively planting the salt marsh species that would come in and colonize those areas and speeding that colonization process up a bit and allowing that um, ecosystem to form more quickly. It can be by trapping sediment within an area um, so that it's not drained away and therefore builds up more quickly. Or we can do something known as intertidal recharge, which is where we actually put the sediment um, that the salt marsh is needed um, there to give the salt marsh the material it needs to form. As well as this, we can realign the defences that are around um, the salt marsh. Um, and there's numerous other sort of um, uh, ways that we can do this. So Managed realignment is when we breach existing seawalls to let the sea into areas that it's previously been cut off from. Um, so that's one example. Um, regulated tidal exchange 
big words, but it is effectively what it says it is. And that involves allowing um, the way that the tide comes and covers an area to be much more controlled um, and allowing it to kind of create or store uh, or restore a habitat without increasing it, the flood risk of that area. Um, or we can do something called tidal flood storage, which is when you reduce the amount of water that is in an estuary. And that can be by creating sort of a lowered embankment or a slice or somewhere for that water to drain away more easily, which allows the site to flood and drain um, in a way that will help that salt marsh kind of perpetuate in that area. There's a lot of work being done all around the UK um, with lots of different methods to kind of manage and um, create salt marsh. The Solway Firth Partnership in the Northwest um, has done a lot of work uh, recently mapping what salt marsh we have in an effort to be able to conserve and restore it better. And a good example of a project that has been um, restoring salt marsh and has quite a lot of information that you can kind of read more about sort of how they've been doing it is Essex Wildlife Trust, um, who've been running a salt marsh restoration project um, down where they are for a number of years now. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so moving on to seagrass. So um, seagrass has been in the news quite a lot. It's sort of um, quite a kind of exciting species at the moment. Um, so it is the only marine flowering plant that we know. Um, and it's known as seagrass because it it's a grass that's in the sea. And it often when you see it in real life, that is often what it looks like. It can form when it's healthy, quite dense meadows in the intertidal and subtidal zones. So intertidal is the area that is covered at high tide and um, exposed at low tide. And then subtidal is just anything that is kind of under the water all of the time. We've got two species that we have in the Northwest. Um, and those are Zostra marina and Zostra noltii. The, these two species are slightly different in the sense that mariner is a bit larger and it tends to be a bit further down in the zone. So it tends to be in the kind of subtidal areas, um, whereas you'll find Nultia a little bit higher up. So it's good that we have both of those species because they're kind of covering different areas and giving us more of a cover of seagrass. So from a blue carbon perspective, um, seagrass has enormous potential in terms of how much caption carbon it captures related to its size. Um, it captures carbon at a rate 35 times faster than the rainforests in the tropics do. And it's responsible for um, about 10% of um, the ocean's total carbon burial globally, despite it only covering what we estimate is about 0.2% of um, the sort of ocean surface. Next slide, please. OK, as well as this, as well as uh, salt marsh in a very similar way, um, seagrasses can protect um, coastal areas from erosion because those plants um, are holding the sediment there by their roots. But they're also what's known as um, an ecosystem engineer. So the sea, the grass meadows themselves um, form a very sheltered and protected um, kind of area. And that's a really important nursery ground for a lot of fish because it provides a lot of cover from predators. Um, so you'll get a lot of commercial species um, that are important for our fish stocks using these areas as a protection from predators. As well as this, you've got shellfish and invertebrate species that will live in the mud, similarly to the way they do in mud flats. And that, again, is an important food source for other predators, um, as well as birds that use this area. And the grass itself is a food source. Um, so Brent geese will um will use seagrass as quite a um quite a large food source and actually quite a few of the records that we have of where seagrass has historically been has been through bird watching records of um people making notes of brent geese being in areas feeding on the seagrass and that's how we know that it's there we have two significant areas that we know of in the northwest one of those um, is predominantly in the walney channel um, we have some seagrass uh, near snab sands area on one side and then roa the roa island area on the other and we have recently discovered um, a sort of relatively substantial meadow for our standards um, in the Ravenglass estuary. So this was first recorded as a sort of incidental sighting in a survey that was surveying other things about 10, about 10 years ago. And um, last year, we went out and actually mapped the extent of this area and um, pleased to say that it's a lot bigger than what they first saw. So um, we're really excited. Uh, that we've got those habitats um, up near us. Next slide, please. 
So here comes the sad bit about seagrass. Um, we have an estimated eight and a half thousand hectares, um, we think, in the UK. Um, there's been a lot of mapping efforts to um, kind of understand how much we have um, recently, but it's still an area that we haven't got a huge amount of information about. The amount that we know about this eight and a half thousand hectares um, relates to about 0.9 megatons of carbon storage. And in the carbon market, that's about 22 million um, pounds worth of carbon. Um, however, this is this area, although it sounds quite large, is considerably less than what we expected we had um, even sort of a century ago. Um, Seagrasses suffered um, from a wasting disease in the 1930s, and this is effectively a disease that caused the plant to, to sort of waste away. And um, so we suffered quite drastic losses then, but its recovery has been quite hampered by human activity. So that can be anything from um, kind of polluting coastal areas or um, developing on them. It can be um, sort of addition of nutrients to the area. It can be also more physical damage. So the picture I've got here is of someone just sort of walking through a seagrass patch. Um, but um, there are meadows where sort of because it's they're occurring in sort of areas that are also used by boats, for example, the boat, the areas where those boats are anchoring to the floor um, cause these sort of scoured patches where the seagrass is really struggling to grow back. And when seagrass is trying to establish a consistent meadow, um, that can be quite problematic. Um, there was a recent study that looked at how much we um, have estimated to have lost in the UK. Um, and from that, um, we recognise that we have lost at least 44% of our seagrass in, in the last um, sort of 90 years in the last century. Um, but if we look back to longer time spans and sort of model back that far, we could have lost um, as high as 92% of what we originally had. Um, so it's a, a really important ecosystem that we really have lost a considerable amount of in the UK. Um, so there's very much an effort to try and put that back. If I could go to the next slide, please. I think maybe two slides along. I think we might have. Yes, this one. Thank you. So, yes, um, I said earlier, there's been quite a lot of um, seagrass uh, restoration projects that have sprung up over the UK in the last um, kind of in the last few years. They're still very much in the experimental stage. And I wish I could have pointed out just the green ones. But basically, this map here is some mapping of just where the projects are occurring around the UK. So lots of different areas. Some of them are focusing on mariner. Um, which is that sort of bigger, lower species that I talked about earlier. Um, but a few projects um, are also focusing on nulti, um, and that's a bit of a newer field. Um, because it's new, we don't have an awful lot of research about the best way to restore these areas. So most, um, if not all, of the projects have had some sort of experimental stage with them. And there's a considerable focus at the moment on trialing different methods of replanting seagrass seeds um, and working out what the best method is of doing that restoration. So we're still in the process of working out what works before we can move to large scale restoration. Next slide, please. OK, and that's this is me. This is me squatting down in my boots last summer, um, spending quite a lot of time counting seeds. Um, so this seagrass is something that um, Cumbria Wildlife Trust are very invested in um, attempting to restore. And we are doing our best to set up restoration projects for this at the moment. Um, we've been surveying the seagrass that we have um, in 2016, 2017, and we've come back to it this year in 20 or well, last year in 2022 to look at the extent of those seagrass beds and seeing how they're changing over time, as well as checking the condition of them. So that's anything from how dense the seagrass is to how many seeds they're producing to any other kind of, um, so whether they're competing with any other species in those areas, things like that to understand how healthy those beds are. We've been looking into the feasibility of restoring those areas. Um, so we've had scoping of the whole Morecambe Bay area to see what's there and what could potentially be done. And then last year, we looked at our Row Island um, seagrass bed to see whether we could potentially use that area in the future as a seed bank use. So seeds, so seagrasses um, have two different ways of reproducing. They can either reproduce sort of from 
the plant itself, but they also produce seeds, which they don't always use. So there's a potential that you can take them from one healthy area without damaging it and use them to restore another area. So the next steps for us are getting a better idea of what we have and continuing that survey to build up our database um, and then potentially um, moving to seed collection trialing those restoration methods and replanting methods that we spoke about before moving into um, hopefully in the future restoring some of the meadows that we will have had in the northwest historically. Next slide please. Just a couple more minutes if it's okay Amber. Sure I will speed through this bit then. So I spent I mentioned earlier that there's a couple of habitats that could be mentioned as um, blue carbon. Um, one of them is shellfish. The reason that this particular habitat could potentially be considered but isn't at the moment is because shellfish um, both re remove carbon from the atmosphere but they also send it back. So they take away a lot of that algae that kind of the plants that are kind of taking that carbon out of the atmosphere and sort of store it away but they also produce carbon dioxide when they're making their shells. So it's very context dependent on whether that can be considered a blue carbon habitat or not. Um, but it's interesting to see whether that happens because we do have a lot of blue mussel reef in the area um, in Soy Firth. Um, and um, it's our most significant shellfish habitat that we have. Next slide, please. Okay, additionally, kelp um, is um, a really important um, sort of habitat that we have in the UK again. And the reason is that it could be blue carbon is because it grows very, very quickly and it takes a lot of carbon in to do that. But the problem with it is that it grows in hard, rocky areas that don't have soils. So when the kelp kind of dies and breaks away, it gets buried somewhere else, not on the site. So it's difficult to understand how much of that kelp is actually getting locked away into the sediment and understand how much carbon it's actually sequestering away. Next slide, please. Um, the reason it's concerning that we're not considering these as blue carbon habitats is because as well as the potential to store more carbon and using that as a reason for um, bringing more of these habitats back around the UK, um, removing or degrading these, these habitats can release carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere because you're allowing that decomposition process to happen if you're taking them away. Um, so it makes it harder to protect them and to include the carbon dioxide that's released from their removal in our blue carbon estimates. Last slide, please. And this is the last one. So... Just to conclude, blue carbon habitats are really important. They do make a significant impact on our UK carbon emissions each year. But we've lost a lot of these habitats over over um, the last even century. And so this year, this figure could be much higher if we invest in kind of restoring these habitats. Um, we also need to do um, a lot more research into both the ones that we know a lot more about to work out how to restore them, but also the understudied habitats to understand whether they can be contributors to our blue carbon targets. Um, as well as protecting their other benefits as well. So next slide, please. Thank you very much for listening. And I believe we'll be taking questions at the end in the discussion. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Amber. That was fascinating. And I've learned Thank so much you. over the last 20 minutes. And as you said, <laughs> if people have got questions, please can you put them in the chat and then we'll, we'll do, take them all as part of a combined Q&A session after the last of the presentations. Lovely, thank you. And sorry for overrunning. <laughs> no, I, I would now like to, to introduce Dr. Sarah Percival from Liverpool John Moores University, uh, who's going to tell us about flood management and resilience. So over to you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Anyway, I was going to talk to you about flood resilience and particularly about some flood resilience activities that I have been part of in um, Cumbria. Uh, just a really quick background of myself. My name is uh, Dr. Sarah Percival. I am a senior lecturer in geography, climate change and environmental sciences at Liverpool John Moores University. I've been researching uh, resilience for and risk and vulnerability, all these kind of terms you might have heard of uh, for a very, very long time. Um, as uh, you can see in the next slide, and as I said at the time, this is not me showing off. This is literally just trying to show that this is something I'm incredibly passionate about, but also have been working on for many, many years. Um, I've worked on risk and resilience, particularly for flood hazards um, since my really since my MSc um, and then really concentrated in, a, in my PhD. And as a senior research associate, I was able to PI, which means principal investigator, be the principal investigator, uh, some 
some projects that were looking at the communication of flood risk, um, but also setting up uh, flood risk networks, um, investigating urban flood management, things like that. And then when I went on to become a lecturer at Liverpool John Moores University, um, I was very, very lucky and I won quite a bit of money and I've been able to set up uh, projects looking at flood resilience and um, looking at flood action group resilience, which is what I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about today, but also looking at flood resilience of traditional buildings um, as a consultant for Historic England. And that's all been going on lately. So, again, this is something, a topic that I have worked on for quite a few years now, but also I really want to improve. So my agenda, which, I would, which is what I went through when I spoke to everybody the other day, um, I just wanted to talk about the current state of affairs, where we are at the moment with regards to flood resilience, what this actual word means, but also how we can enhance community resilience, something that is really, really important in terms of enhancing our flood resilience as a whole and flood action groups and where they fit in this whole picture. So where are we at the moment? Well, unfortunately, uh, the UK obviously suffers with flooding a lot. Um, there's been many, many uh, flood disasters over the last, especially over the last 20 years. And Cumbria has definitely seen some of the worst ones um, with 2009, 2015 coming to mind. Um, if we're talking particularly about coastal resilience or coastal flood resilience, um, we got, had a real wake up call in 2013 and 14, uh, which were the storm surges that occurred then, and they went on for many, many weeks. And those winter floods really, really did leave a huge amount of families, landowners, businesses um, with a very slow state of recovery. And this created a wider sense of, um, of public anger and also anger in communities or just frustration because these the impacts from these flood events were substantial um, and they were widespread in terms of a lot of areas of the UK being, effect, uh, being affected. But, you know, that was kind of like the last what I'd call big storm surges that we've had, but we get countless floods, unfortunately, almost on a yearly basis in the UK. We also suffer with pretty much every type of flooding there is, uh, whether it's a coastal flood, whether it's from your rivers, whether it's or, or fluvial flooding, as we call it, whether it's from the groundwater, whether it's from surface water, which is from the drainage systems, or from slow onset, where it's just drain that's just occurring time and time again, which is what happened in 2007 uh, when we had rain after rain after rain after rain. Or there's also flash flooding, which is very, very quick, um, but very, very powerful. And we're seeing more of those on the rise. Or worst of all, you get a combination of all of them. And that's kind of like um, what happened in the Somerset levels. There was a combination of a couple of those that came together, which is why it was so, again, impact heavy. Um, unfortunately, as well, in terms of uh, where we are in the UK, due to the its diversity, it's really difficult and expensive to reduce flood risk. It's very, very complicated. And that's due to not only the, you know, things like geology, the flood type, stuff like that, but also just us and who we are and what we do and, you know, how we how we are not in the way, but in terms of like that flood, there's a lot going on when that flood hits that area. There's a lot of different things happening. And current levels of adaptation in the UK really, really do need to improve. Um, added to that, we are looking at in the future, potentially many, many properties being in high, in levels of high risk, uh, where there isn't going to be extra forms of resistance given. So I extra things like um, defence me uh, measures, because from a cost benefits point of view, it doesn't really quite make much sense. But also, um, you know, there has to be a balance somewhere and I think what the government is, has been saying in the past and what came out of the pitch review in 2008 is that they just can't protect everybody. So what do we do then? Um, and this is where resilience kind of comes in because resilience measures that are made by the uh, local community or by just individuals themselves can really do really make a big difference here and it might be the only thing that's kind of available. But what is this word? What is this word resilience? 
Well, the concept resilience has been out there for a while. Um, it started in the 70s by Holling, where the original concept of resilience was seen as a measure of persistence of systems and their ability to absorb change and disturbance and still maintain the same relationships between populations and state variables. That's a very complex way of saying it's an, our ability to sustain, it's our ability to cope. Some people call it bouncing back. Um, Officially, in terms of flooding, there isn't like a flood resilience index out there. There isn't like what I would call an official measurement, but there is definitely certain characteristics within our systems, within our communities that we can use to kind of measure this element. Uh, but exactly what those things are, we're still working on that in terms of science. But basically, it means how do we kind of get back to where we were, but still maintain some certain processes that need to be maintained. So in terms of flood resilience, you could describe it as the most essential features of the system uh, recover from those disturbances. So um, things like your utilities, things like your food supply, you're able to get back onto their feet very, very quickly. We can, you know, still go about our daily lives. We can still do things, even though the flood has occurred, those systems still exist. So that's just an example. So it kind of means that the recovery means that the principal characteristics of the system are basically restored. However, they don't have to look exactly the same as they were previously. So when you have something like a flood occur, you're principal components of the systems that we live in <clears throat> or the or things that we do on a daily day basis don't have to be exactly the same as they were before that hazard occurred they just have to you know work to some degree um, that we can actually do what we need to do so flood resilience can be seen as a community or the systems within those communities ability to either def defy or alter itself so that the damage of the floods is either mitigated or minimized. So rather that flood becoming a disaster where, you know, um, things have gone very, very wrong and the impacts are huge, those impacts are minimized and we are able to kind of just minimize what those impacts are, but just either defy ourselves or alter ourselves in terms of, you know, what we're doing or what us, you know, what the systems that we depend on are doing so they can actually cope with this kind of stuff. So community resilience is being seen more and more as an essential uh, kind of um, element to flood risk management. It's being seen as something that we need to do more and more because defences just don't work on their own anymore. Um, and to be fair, I'm not sure they ever did. It was something that actually was all it should always be part of it you know a, a defense system you know it will help um hopefully it might even um work to the point that it doesn't allow the water to overtop it which is what you want a defense system to do but ultimately due to climate change those defenses are being pushed to their limits because the water levels are getting higher or the rains are coming in more and therefore um you know, they might not be able to do what we need them to do to for every event. And so therefore, resilience is really key, especially community resilience, um, because for some communities that might be the only form of local resistance present, because there might either be a management system there that it's not being improved upon, or it might not be there at all. Um, so again, it highlights why um, community resilience is so important but what is it and i think well this this is the real key question what 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 does it mean well sometimes it could just be simple actions it might be something as simple as putting like maybe a flood barrier on your on your home it might be something as simple as perhaps being prepared if a flood was to occur like you know exactly what to do you got your insurance details you have insurance you um know what the flood warnings mean you are able to take action very quickly um that's just a small example of some um, some elements or what factors that could be seen as resilience. Um, but those simple actions, if everyone's doing those kind of things, um, can significantly reduce local vulnerability and the level of damage from an inundation event. And that's what we all want. So flood action group resilience, where does this come in? Um, well, hopefully you might have heard of flood action groups. Flood action groups um, are set up by the National Flood Forum. 
which is a standalone kind of, you know, like uh, groups like charity who are kind of what I would call the middlemen in terms of like flooding their, you know, um, they're in between, you know, people like the Environment Agency and the community. They're very much on uh, there to represent and help the communities get back on their feet again. Um, but basically they form these flood action groups. And these are very much voluntary grassroots groups. There's about like um, over 400 of them now. Uh, and they are key to founding and embedding resilience in flood prone communities. Uh, they provide a lot of things. They provide a platform to address local flood management concerns so people can come together and really talk about, you know, what they think are the concerns here from a flood management point of view. They can also take those concerns to stakeholders because the National Flood Forum will help set them up in terms of relationships with different stakeholders. Uh, understand the future intended approaches. They can assist in terms of flood asset utility maintenance. Uh, they can help create a wider awareness of flood risk in the area. And they can also instigate flood watchers, prepare to reduce or help to prepare future, uh, reduce future flood impacts. So they can do a lot of different things, these groups. And I've worked with lots of them now and they are great groups who have a huge amount of potential. And these actions are crucial as flood events are expected to increase, as I said earlier before, unfortunately, due to climate change in both frequency and impact. So there's this real urgent need at the moment uh, for new local economic and proactive and sustainable flood management approaches that engage with a much wider set of tools, i.e. not just, you know, um, let's put to defence structure in. This is a much wider approach, you know, something like having a flood action group on, um, in that area as well. It's going to do even more. And we can, if we can utilise this, then hopefully we can be much more effective in terms of our uh, flood risk management especially as there is the chance that we're going to get so many more of these events in the future. However, though, the issue we have, though, um, with flood action groups is, um, unfortunately, sometimes their longevity, their functionality, i.e. the resilience of the groups themselves is a little precarious. Um, some groups are fine and they are able, to, they, they keep continuing and they continue very well. Some, though, don't and we don't really know why that is. So some groups in the long run have actually become ineffective in terms of their functionality, functionality, sorry, and in terms of their practice. And that includes imperatively they're in communication with other stakeholders, which is probably one of the most important things that they do. It is key that we that the flood action groups um, are ultimately resilient as the longevity is essential to hopefully ensure that the flood resilience within a community in Jaws, especially if the area is vulnerable uh, to flooding. Um, otherwise, if you don't have these groups, it is likely that unfortunately the vulnerability will return and the impacts again will increase. It's also quite a cost effective uh, management um, um, practice, if you want to call it that. Um, but like it, it really does help in terms of um, it can embed a lot of resistance within communities most at, at risk as it as it does so in a way that reflects their actual needs and their preferences because it's the locals themselves that are kind of driving it. Um, so we need them to be effective in the long term, these flood action groups. So therefore, we need to understand the critical success factors that can affect these kind of voluntary or community led groups. And crucially, they need to be under Stood, they need to be modelled, and that's where someone like myself comes in. Um, and I did a pilot study for the National Flood Forum. I want a little bit of money that allowed me to do this, and we actually used Cumbria as a case study because Cumbria, as I said before, has flooded many times, as I'm sure you guys know. And um, there are a lot of flood action groups in Cumbria. I think there's 23 in total, and it was we wanted to see where thing how things had happened uh, worked for them you know were they all you know able to had they all continued well or in terms of their functionality in terms of their practice or had some of them disbanded and we knew some of them had so and we wanted to know why that was what was going on what was what what was causing um that and you know how do these uh, groups work and um under the guidance of the national flood forum i set up a workshop and some surveys and also some activities and we invited all the flood action groups from cumbria to come along for a day and they came along and were very very kind and gave us a huge amount of their time and we were able to get a huge amount of information from them now the end goal 
goal originally was to try and get a guidance or some kind of flood action group best practice from this activity. And even though we got a huge amount of information from the flood action groups, we could see that we just literally scratched the surface on this thing and we needed to speak to many other uh, flood action groups in the future to actually get a real good grip in terms of what we're driving these factors in terms of you know why some groups are working and why some groups weren't so i won't go on for too much longer uh, because i'm aware that <laughs> the time is ticking on and originally i was asked to talk to 15 minutes but as i've done this as a and i've done this again i thought i'd give you guys a little bit extra as i have a little bit of time and apologies for the picture of myself it was just to show you that this workshop had occurred. Um, unfortunately, the university wanted a picture of me in this, um, so we'll just ignore that. But anyway, this is just to give you some photos from what happened on the day. Um, as you can see, there's, there's quite a few groups of people walking around and we did four different exercises um, with them. We looked at the flood action group practice. We then looked at what flood resilience means, what flood action group resilience meant or what the participants felt that meant, stakeholder engagement, things like they did with stakeholder engagement, you know, the problems they've had, who they'd had problems with and who they hadn't, and then also the flood action group functionality. And I'm not going to dwell on this for too long, but this just shows you the amount of material that was gathered. This is some of the material from some of the activities. And just to go through the the um, main results. Um, the results here are really, really promising, but also, again, highlight that more work needs to be done. But uh, this uh, work is going to be uh, showcased at Flood and Coast in June um, to just go through some of these findings and, and talk about where we need to go next in terms of this work. But just to very quickly, in a nutshell, um, when it came to um, group factors, what they felt in terms of longevity, so key resilient um, flood action group factors for Cumbria. Uh, group spirit was seen as to be the most important thing. What they meant by that was the persistence, determination. So knowledge and experience, engagement with stakeholders, you know, so the knowledge that they had or the knowledge they gained, or the experience they gained, those were seen as very important. Also the dynamics of the group, you know, leadership, frank discussions, you know, their ability to work as a group, they were actually seen as the really important points in terms of longevity and what affected longevity of a group. Key stakeholders that they felt they had to engage with, mostly councils, association, charities, trusts and parks, environment agency, those were kind of seen as the top three. It'd be really interesting to see if that was different if we spoke to another area of the country, um, um, if the trusts or the parks was of course quite such a feature they might not be in terms of what was working in flood action groups in cumbria uh, the group dynamics they felt was working um as were the achievements of the group which i thought was really really interesting um some other things like community engagement productivity installation defenses or the help them helping defenses come um, into play. But what was not working was really stake. This is where stakeholder relationships and actions showing how important that is was really, you could see, really dominating the results here. And again, that kind of went, that theme led on um, further on. You can see stakeholder relationships and actions, what could be better, the barriers, relationships with stakeholders. So there's a running theme here that this was definitely something the flood action groups felt was a problem and where, you know, they needed work needed to be done on this. Um, in terms of different support received by flood action groups, you know, they felt that they would like some funding support. I think the other big one here was this one um, from the Environment Agency. Uh, what else do flood action groups need? The big one here was a governmental legislation change. So this was another exercise where we asked them, you know, what did we, you know, what, what else needed to happen in terms of flood action groups to make it uh, change. And just very, very quickly, the summary was that basically uh, we, we collated a lot of different groups, uh, sorry, a lot of the different results from the groups, but we could see that, again, as I said, more work needed to be done, but we could see some of the perhaps main trends where the problems were being felt, but also where they felt they'd actually, what they'd achieved in terms of where they were being more effective. So again, very, very, very quickly, I've run through those results, but it was just to highlight some work that's been happening in Cumbria, but also um, in terms of community resilience, you know, how we can advance that and make that more effective. And uh, it's seen that flood action groups is definitely one of those uh, ways to do that. And they have great promise in terms of what they can achieve. But unfortunately, like a lot of community or 
voluntary led groups. Sometimes um, they don't always work in the long run and it's trying to work out why that is and how we can improve that and how the National Flood Forum can improve that to help make these groups more effective and then enhance community resilience in the long run. Anyway, I hope you found that interesting. Um, thank you for your time. And yes, I've gone on a little bit more than I probably should, but uh, hopefully you'll have um, found that an interesting thought. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Sarah. I know there'll be questions for you after we've heard from Ian uh, Wheeler from Cumbria LEP, who's going to talk to us about offshore wind development and opportunities. So over to you, Ian. Uh, thank you very much, John, and thank you for inviting me this morning. So I'm Ian Wheeler and I lead on clean energy and business decarbonisation for the Cumbria Local Enterprise Partnership. So if you want to go to slide mode and go to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, back one. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll provide a brief outline of our current position and then talk about future opportunities for offshore uh, wind or around the coast of Cumbria. So next slide, please, John. So for Cumbria, we have two existing clusters. We have Robin Rig in the north of the county uh, in the Solway that's operated by RWE from Workington. And then in the south of the county in green, you see six separate wind farms that are operated by Orsted and Vattenfell out of the Port of Barrow. Um, offshore electricity is not really allocated on a county basis, but if it was, um, the, all of these uh, current developments would equate to about 1.8 gigawatts of capacity, which is about 14 percent of uh, UK's current offshore output. So around Cumbria, we make a significant existing contribution uh, to UK's offshore wind. Um, in orange, you can see that there are new developments coming to the wider Irish Sea south of Barrow. So we've got Morgan and Mona, which are being developed by BP and a German company called ENBW, and then a separate Morecambe development by a Spanish company, Cobra, and a Scottish-based company, Flotation Energy. So these combined will give 3.5 gigawatts capacity with, a, with between 200 and 300 new big turbines uh, coming to the Irish Sea. To put that into perspective, that's bigger capacity than Hinkley Point Nuclear Power Station that's been constructed in Somerset. So this is really, really uh, significant. Um, these developments currently in the planning design phase, and, and, and I'll bring you to your attention that there is an open consultation in progress until the 4th of June. There are, I think there are open day events in, in Barrow, and at the end of the presentation, I'll provide a link to, 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 how, to how you can find out more about those. These new developments plan to be in operation by 2029. So next slide, please. So just to get over the scale of offshore wind, so these new developments will be a significant contribution to the UK's offshore target to achieve 50 gigawatts uh, by 2030. Um, Offshore wind, for good reason, is leading the way for UK clean energy generation. Costs have lowered significantly over the last decade to be the cheapest form of electricity generation. The scale of offshore dwarfs onshore developments with turbines nearly five times the height of an average onshore wind turbine. And, and clearly there, there are many more of, of them in a wind farm. In fact, if it wasn't for two facts, I'm sure offshore wind could meet the UK's electricity demand in its entirety. But two key challenges. One, alas, the wind does not blow all of the time. And secondly, allude, alluding to um, Amber's first presentation, Offshore wind does give a biodiversity challenge and needs serious consideration through, through the planning and consultation phase. If I go to my last slide. Um, we, the, the Cumbria Local Enterprise Partnership, we, we published our clean energy strategy last year and, and offshore wind was a key part of that. And we had four, four key objectives that we, we want to achieve. 
first of all, we want to make the most of what we have got. Uh, some of our older offshore wind farms are well over 10 years old and they operate in a harsh marine environment. So simply we want to maximize the, the, the output from our existing wind farms and make sure they operate as, as long as possible. Secondly, for the new Irish Sea development, we want Barrow to be the operations and maintenance centre. Being realistic, the big manufacturing uh, and construction will, will go, go elsewhere in the UK and the grid connections will be in Lancashire and, and North Wales. But there are significant supply chain opportunities for our companies and we can grow on the Port of Barrow's existing capabilities and there'll be hundreds of skilled operations and maintenance jobs for, for many decades. Thirdly, we, we will continue to engage with Crown Estates for further, develop, for further expansion, but I have to say this will be long term. With, with other developments around the UK and with float, floating wind coming to the southwest of the UK in the Celtic Sea, the, there's already a clear route for the UK to achieve 30, 30 gigawatts uh, by 2030. So I, th I think the focus is on getting the, the, the existing sites that are under plan um, up and away by, by the end of this decade to, to, meet, to meet that target. But nevertheless, still significant potential off our coast for further development in the future. Finally, one last challenge for us, um, an, op an opportunity or, or another challenge for offshore wind, as, as well as the fact that the wind doesn't blow all the time, at other times it produces too much uh, electricity that the grid cannot cope with, and it needs to be in, in, in technical uh, parlance, uh, it needs to be curtailed. So wouldn't it be good if we could use this surplus for hydrogen generation, which has significant clean energy potential, especially for things like industrial decarbonisation and heavy transport, uh, transport uses. So we, so we in the LEPA are actively pursuing that and, and see that as an area of, of significant uh, development in, into the future. Finally, some, some links for further re reading for anybody interested. So there's a link unashamedly to our clean energy strategy. Uh, the, the Cumbria LEP are part of a offshore energy alliance which uh, which promotes offshore development in, in the northwest of England and, and North Wales so this is a partnership with operators developers manufacturers and and uh, and, and others to, to promote offshore wind in the northwest and then finally as I discussed earlier there's a link to both the Morecambe and Morgan uh, offshore developments uh, and, it, and to, to say there's the consultations open till the 4th of June. Uh, so that's, that's it from me. So finally, uh, my, my last point would be that in the government's uh, published 10 point plan for net zero, offshore wind was point number one for, and for very good reason. And, and we are actively want Cumbria to be a, a, a part of that. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, Ian, and, and really interesting to hear about the sort of potential for offshore wind in Cumbria and the contribution it can make overall to the UK's uh, uh, net zero ambition. Thanks very much, Amber, for covering all the different sources of uh, uh, in terms of blue carbon solutions. And I'm sure there's work that we can do through the ZCTP to help promote the opportunities there. Um, thank you also to Sarah for um, highlighting the importance of flood uh, resilience and the, and the need to be proactive. I see there's a comment in the chat from Ian just about how difficult it is to predict where the next floods might arise, but clearly important work there that we must uh, take account of in terms of adaptation as well as mitigation and potentially linking into some of the, the Cumbria Sustainability Groups. And also thank you very much to Ian for covering the um, opportunities associated with offshore uh, wind in particular and other renewables. Uh, also, thank you very much for attending and for all the comments and the questions in the chat. Uh, thank you also for perver persevering with the challenges we did have with the audio. I understand from Sarah that the hotel did say that the audio, that the internet connection should be fine. But I think with the combination of slides and, and the audio that we've got, uh, the main points of Sarah's presentation. So thank you very much for that. So um, 
uh, as I say, thank you all for attending. We'll send a link out to the recording plus some supporting information resources. Uh, and we very much hope to see you at future events. And finally, just to thank you, thank Nigel for helping to organize and run the event. So thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>